How you guys doing? Hello and happy Father's Day. Yeah, happy Father's Day to you, to you guys. You too. Weather's uh, the weather's heating up. Well, there's no spring anymore, man. It, it goes right from forty to eighty around these parts. At least it has in the last several years. Now, Nico, I don't know if you ever even remember spring. You're so young. Do you remember when we used to have yeah. a season called spring? Yeah, it usually lasts about a week. <laughs> Used to be back in the day, it would be like all of May into June, you get 70 degrees. It was, you know, it's perfect, but no such luck, at least lately. So I heard it's supposed to be like 70s, 70 tomorrow. So I'm going to try to cut the grass. We've been getting between thunderstorms and then the, uh, you know, I'm not cut, you know, it's 90 some degrees out, you know, it gets humid. The other thing seasonally, I don't know, I saw my first uh, lightning bugs of the summer when I was out walking the dog. I love those things, man. That's that's when I know summer's here, man. I have not seen any. No, you haven't? You know, not, it's weird. Not yet. Like out west, like in uh, California, they don't have them. Obviously, it's like a completely different ecosystem out there. But that's, to me, it's such an integral part of summer that, uh, at least for me, I really love that part of it. Uh, so yeah, it's, it's funny. Like Sasha never saw them growing up. You know, it was like, some like weird phenomenon when she came out here and saw bugs lighting up all of a sudden. Yeah, there's different part, you know, yeah, different ecosystems is part of the earth that part, you know, that they never, they don't get tornadoes ever. So they don't know what a tornado, the, you know, what, you know, the damage that a tornado can create. And that's pretty mid, we uh, like unique to the Midwest and America, right? I mean, I have them occasionally at the rest of the world, but there's something about the way the Gulf Stream and the Arctic air mixes here and like the plains where we just get so many. I've never actually seen one. Have you seen one? Uh, well, I saw, uh, I got a picture of it from, uh, well, yes, twice. So the first time was uh, Kevin and I were flying in his plane. At the time he had a, just a single engine Cherokee Arrow we were flying into land. Uh, to, we were trying to, because we were trying to outrun this thunderstorm. And uh, yeah, I, so I got a picture of the funnel cloud. Um, and the other time was maybe 12, 13 years ago, something like that. Uh, a tornado landed, touched down about a mile or so from where I lived uh, when I was living on the border of Chicago and Elmwood Park. That was bizarre because the sky was green. You could smell like electricity in the air. When I walked down my back deck, the hairs on my arms literally stood up. Okay. There was just that much charge in the air. Uh, sirens going off, you know, all of that. Uh, and I thought for sure that, you know, it was going to land, you know, where I lived, but it, it didn't, you know, um, yeah, so that was a few years ago, but yeah, oof. it's un it's unbelievable. Well, seeing it in a plane's got to be terrifying, man. Like on the ground, at least you can get to cover, but if you're up in well, the air. Yeah, I'll, well, I'll show you. I uh, think I know where the picture is next time I see you. Um, well, you know, pilots have told me a uh, pilot uh, will only fly in a thunderstorm once, you know, and it's a double-edged thing. Either it scares them and they'll never fly again or the plane goes down. Uh, so yeah, we just had no choice to try to outrun this thing. Uh, Cause we got caught smack dab in it when we took off out of Mena, Arkansas. And I, I thought we were going down. 
I swear, I thought the plane, we even said our goodbyes to each other, okay? We thought that plane was going down. But we were able to get out of it and ultimately land overnight in Macon, Georgia. And then in the morning, see, we were all ideally trying to go down to the Florida Keys. So in the morning, we only had a few hours sleep. In the morning, we took off and this, we ended up only making it to Fort Myers. Then we got socked in for three days. Uh, you know, and at the time, Kevin was um, only rated VFR, so visual. So he couldn't fly in the clouds, this and that. So bad weather grounded you. So we made it as far as Fort Myers and then spent like three days there and then started to head back to uh, Chicago. But yeah, yeah, you don't want to get involved in bad storms when you're uh, in a plane or maybe, you know, even driving a car. I'm sure both of you guys have had a pull over just from, you know, bad weather when driving. I know I have on more than one occasion. I've definitely had it where the rain yeah, was it sounds, sounds scarier. Oh, yeah. Definitely. Sounds a lot scarier on a plane. Well, the, the, the funnel cloud was, was not scary. Uh, no, the, the only reason being, literally, it was off a little bit, off a ways, and we were approaching the runway. Okay, so we were coming down. All right, so we were so spent from the previous night uh, we were bruised. It looked like we went, you know, we were in a, in a, in a fight. I mean, cause you got two big guys in a very small airplane. So the airplane was like this way and coming down. Okay. And I remember telling Kevin and, and by the way, it was dark and we're, there's mountains. So we are, we were just lucky. Unfortunately, you know, we perished going to be four years ago coming up in a plane crash, but, uh, we were just so spent, you know, but as I said, we, we, we said our goodbyes. And I remember telling Kevin, and, and this is what goes through your head at moments like that. I'm like, don't let the plane come nose down. If you're going to crash, let's like belly flop kind of thing. You know, I remember saying that. I mean, I remember at first telling him land this thing. And then he's like, I can't. And I'm like, Oh boy, that's the last thing you want to hear. So, his whole point was to get higher, get more altitude. So you have time to correct because, you know, that shit will push you down, you know, and, it'll, you know, it could, it could force you to, to crash down a plane. So we were battling both of us on the controls and we were strong. We were doing everything we could uh, to keep that plane aloft. And, uh, and luckily, you know, we did, but, oh yeah, that, that pales to anything I've ever experienced in a car as far as bad weather. Uh, you know, it, it's, yeah. What are you gonna do? Hmm. I think I could see myself, you, you seen those crazy guys who are storm chasers. They like spend time, they drive around and they try and find tornadoes. Yeah. I, could, I could see myself maybe one spring some year trying to do that. Cause I would like to see like a tornado. I mean, I've had, sirens going off and i've seen that weird gray green sky that you talk about where it's like you know it's, it's very very unique to when that you know happens uh but never just laid eyes on a true funnel cloud you know and it's just i mean obviously it's it's probably as stupid as trying to go into a shark cage or something you know <laughs> like if you can see it you should probably be getting cover but if you can but it's just one of those you know awesome things of nature to uh, see. Like, I love like watching lightning storms too. I'm, I, I, I don't say, I'd get, like if it's, if I can see it off in the distance, I'll stand a while and watch it, which is probably not the smartest thing. But uh, yeah, I'd love all that kind of energetic weather like that. Well, you know, just don't tempt fate. <laughs> like, you know, playing with wild animals or mother nature or something like that. Normally, normally doesn't end up, doesn't end well. <laughs> True true um so i, I guess to, oh, no, no. no i was just gonna say I, I don't know if i was born or if it happened when i was a young kid but there was a tornado that landed on the west side of cleveland actually in cleveland because i can remember um my great aunt talking about it when i was a young kid but i don't remember if it happened when i was you know like a one year old or if it was before i was born uh, and then of course 
Xenia, Ohio. I remember that. That's mm. nowhere near Cleveland, but it got the town got leveled. <laughs> we had something called a microburst in Lombard. Um, maybe it's been 10 years ago already. I, I kind of lose track of the time. But um, and it came through the city of Chicago. It was like a fast moving storm because I was working downtown and people were seeing it on their computers and it was crazy. But I think a, a big portion of it hit Lombard. When we got there, um, well, there was a lot to it. The, the principal of my kid's school actually got fired over it because I believe he locked the doors to the school and said, everybody run home, like get home as fast as you can, instead of letting them back into the school for safety. So that was it for him. Um, but the, the aftermath was insane. I still have some pictures of it, but like, you know, like after a big snowstorm, everybody has like huge piles of snow in front of their, you know, on the driveways and stuff. That's how tree branches were like up and down every street, trees were down, tree branches were piled up or, or smashed into people's houses. Um, our house was without power for like three or four days, you know, and we, uh, the basement flooded. I mean, and it wasn't even a tornado. It was just like, they, I think they categorize as a, a, a microburst or something, but it like it changed like we lost tons and tons of trees and like i said people were just out with chainsaws because trees streets were blocked with you know huge trees that were down uh but yeah it was it was like it felt like three or four days to recover from that the neighborhood well we're speculating that it was pro it was a microburst that brought heaven's plane down because the last official communication was there was a uh, uh un something i forgot what the, the first word was uh, unusual weather phenomenon so, that broke that plane up in the air. So, uh, yeah, you just don't want to, yeah, you got to be careful, man. You know, it's, you want to see it. You want to experience, I get it. Kind of like the daredevil in you, but you just, you know, you got to be careful. <laughs> man, don't get me wrong. I want to see it from a nice safe distance. <laughs> well, how about t television, like a hundred miles away? Is that safe enough for you? Same, <laughs> like a rent wizard of Oz, if I want to see one. Just don't wear the red slippers. Well, yeah, I've got my 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 pair of various clickers. So, <laughs> so I had a question or kind of an idea. There was um, I saw a post online, and it was a couple posts, but they all kind of had the same theme and just a, an interesting observation. Um, it was someone, you know, they were an instructor, kind of a well-known instructor, a very popular martial art. I won't, won't go without saying, but I figure people can figure it out. But they were kind of, there was some back and forth online uh, with them and some other people about, you know, is this martial art over time becoming watered down because it's become much more popular? Um, uh, you know, and, and I, they kind of were making parallels with what they saw from like their karate instructor and, you know, how, like they were talking about how badass their instructor was back in the 70s, but now, you know, it's kind of, that quality hasn't been there. You know, they were kind of talking about the feats of strength that their karate instructor can do, like, you know, break baseball bats over the shin and whatnot. And, but as it became more accessible to more and more people, it invariably, you know, um, it diluted things maybe was their point. And so, A, you know, my question is, is, you know, is that maybe somewhat inevitable, do you think, if something becomes more widely you know you know normally there's a hard crew core group of people who normally start things off and and go with things uh but then if it if it naturally kind of expands to the point where you know you know it's in every town and whatnot that it's inevitable that um you're not going to have that same caliber and there was another observation that i heard kind of that dove, uh, dovetailed with it and it kind of ties into the and i'm not a business expert or whatever but it seemed to make sense that this one instructor said you know if I could do it, I would get rid of 90% of my students and only keep that 10%, the real hardcore. But he says, but I need that other 90 to keep afloat. So I guess kind of what I'm, my observation is, is there that kind of, if you're gonna be financially successful or to, to run a, you know, a business, there's that kind of trade-off and it's something you have to guard against. So part of it is you're not gonna have, you know, just a, that real hard crew core group. You know, you're only gonna come across a small percentage of people who can, you know, give it their all and be there all the time. But there's also going to be, you know, and what are the trade-offs, I guess, to an instructor in a school? I don't know if you guys have had those observations or, or thought about that. Of course. 
Yeah. You know, I mean, that's been the biggest thing with, with me for 25 years is everybody says, Tony's too hardcore. And that's why I've never had, and I won't sell out. And you, you know, so I'm, I've kept it, you know, as hardcore as, as ever. And that's why you don't get many students because they want, they want fun. They, you know, people, yeah. And there's some people there that just aren't into the hardcore. So I won't say it's inevitable because in my case, it's, uh, I never changed. You know, I've actually gotten more hardcore and less, uh, oh, what's the word I'm looking for? Less understanding. Like in the beginning, 25 years ago, everybody wanted to learn just grappling, you know, just like for sport. And it was, you know, well, you were partly there for maybe some of it, Joe, but it was always when I would show them techniques, I, it was always, I can't do this. I can't do that. We're not allowed to do this. We're not allowed to do that. So in, in a slight way, I capitulated, okay? I said, all right, well, you can't use this technique, can't use leg locks, can't use that, you know. Finally, it got to, well, then what, what, what are you here for? You know, you're, you're not learning what, what I teach now. You, know, you want me to kind of like just change. So I quit that. So, and my business suffered, you know, immeasurably, okay? To the point where it never recovered. So from a business standpoint, it's not functional. And um, the few martial arts schools that I was involved with, on a, they were more, uh, they, they were all about kids classes. And there was this, was it NAPMA, I think it was, North American Professional Martial Arts or something. I went to one of their seminars and that was basically what it was about, structuring and having kids class, you know, ch children like two, three years old, whatever it was, I, I don't remember the exact age group, and then slightly older, and then teens, and then adults, and ladies classes. Yeah, it became very segmented. Um, so yeah, I think, you know, there's 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 the martial art thing, and then there's the business thing, and it's it's hard to make them go. Uh, and from the martial art instructors that I know, MMA is you're it's almost impossible to run an MMA school because so many of those guys don't feel like they need to pay. So MMA is almost like a uh, avocation, right? Or a side thing. And these instructors that own buildings sometimes are forced to rent out space uh, or, you know, it's tough. It's, 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 it's hard. So, uh, you know, but as far as the purity of the, style i can't you know i don't know what the style is that you're talking about i don't know how tough it was and you know how hardcore it was in the beginning but um not all schools were hardcore even 50 years ago you know some were but not all true and i was kind of i mean i wasn't being specific intentionally yeah. and also just kind of as a hypothetical to kind of uh, you know kind of call out the, the tension between the two because there is you know, and, and how to get that balance. And like you said, I, I've heard a lot of um, people who own schools say they, you know, what keeps them afloat is the kids' classes, you know, getting right. the kids in there, because that's just the constant that, you know, and actually, you know, like you said, hardcore training isn't for everybody. There's just a, you know, a handful of people, you know, that can, are willing to pay to come in and get their ass kicked. That's not, you know, it's not an easy thing to market, you know, people have to want it, you know, and have a, know what they want. So um, it is definitely, uh, a, a tough thing to uh, to balance, you know. Um, when you have a smaller window, too, you know, um, your body, you know, your prime years, and you, is it? Do you want to dedicate your prime athletic life, you know, to martial arts, uh, to hardcore martial arts, no matter what the style is? Um, and in a city like bigger cities, I would think it would be more difficult to find that smaller towns where there's nothing else to do you okay yeah i got nothing else to do i'm going to pour it into martial arts but in a town like chicago where you have park park districts that play hardball that play softball that play soccer basketball you have all these different other things you know golf and whatever that people uh tennis 
I don't want to exclude anything, but you get my point. Where there's there's a lot of that going on. So people are like, well, I want to be able to enjoy all of this. You know, um, you flag football or bar bar league football used to be a big thing. I'm I don't know if it still is, but you know, uh, so yeah, there's validity to that. And, and if anybody tries to say different, I, I would I'm sure there's exceptions. I'm sure there's schools out there that are that that have been able to maintain hardcore and still function financially. But you know, you'd have to look at that as a unique uh, situation. There, there's, you know, what's his rent? Where did he find these this crew of people, these students? Uh, and what, how financially successful is the person? You know. There's a couple of martial arts schools in, in a neighboring little town over here. And like one, they have their, I've never seen them open, either one of them, because I don't really go out in the evenings, but they're open just a few days a week and like from 6 p.m. to like 8 p.m. Okay, so two hours, like four days a week. So that's obviously not a successful school. You're not, you know, this guy's, whoever owns it is doing it as a side was a hobby or, you know, or like a break even kind of thing just to cover his rent. Um, but you're not going to tell me you're, you know, he's a multimillionaire on two hours a day, you know, four days a week or whatever. Yeah, that's a, it's, that's a really tough business. Um, like you were saying, Joe, it's, it's hard to find the balance because, okay. So let's say like every school you were saying has a group of hardcore students so your your group of what you would consider hardcore, like you know the the elite athletes of the place, these are the these are the people that are generally between, you know, twenty to their upper twenties, and those people generally just don't have money to pay the gym, or not a lot of money. Some of them, I know a lot of gyms they don't even pay. Um, <clears throat> so the school has to market to other groups. They have to market to an older group and they have to do it to the children. The, the kids program is what generally I think funds most of these successful schools, but also it's, it's your business people. It's your, your older people that can afford to pay into the gym. So to find that balance where everybody, I, I would think you would have to have like a different type of class. You might have a class for fighters you know, that hardcore younger group and then have a class for the older people, the people that they're there for a workout, they're there for self-defense, but they're not going to get into the cage. They're not, they're not going to be like, you know, at, <clears throat> at the Abu Dhabi championships or anything like that. Those are the high paying clients. The, those are the ones that they, the gym really needs to keep to fund everything. So I, you know, to me, I would think you would have to have a different type of class or at least train in a way to where everybody can can train and and learn at the same time, which that seems to be very difficult. You're right. I, I concur. And like I said, I, I don't know. I, I've been training for a lot of years. That's almost 30 years. I've been teaching like full time, I guess you'd say, if you can call it, you know, and um yeah, it's, you know, and I've never, I mean, I had a traditional school in a way when I was at, you know, in Bensonville, but yeah, it, you, you know, I had just a handful of students because it's, it's, I made them go through the whole nine yards, even at Triton College, I made them go through the conditioning, this and that, and there, even when I was not charging anybody, okay, they couldn't handle the conditioning, the conditioning was too much for them. They come from other combat oriented schools and they could not handle the conditioning, which is they were gassing out shit. And instead of sticking, some stuck with it, but a lot didn't. They're like, this is too hard. It's, I don't, you know, it's too much. Okay. That's again, like I mentioned on the other day, I did a podcast with, with Russell Stutley and I said, it's everybody has their own tastes. Okay. But with me, you've got to pay your dues. You're not going to train with me for a weekend and be certified. You know, it doesn't work that way. Uh, and I think that is the, the, crust, the crux of what Joe is getting at, perhaps, in this, that the, the students 
that aren't really super hardcore, they take what they want, then they perpetuate the watered down stuff because then they start showing people stuff either professionally or just, uh, you know, on the side. And then it, that starts to mushroom, okay? And the hardcore group, you know, if there's seven or eight of them in the school, you know, are, are they going to teach? Whereas you have the 40 people or the 50 people that aren't doing the hardcore stuff. So it's a number, it becomes a numbers game. And, um, you know, it's, uh, it, it's an individual decision and situation to the instructor, uh, what they choose to do. But, um, yeah, it, all, overall, it's not healthy. Uh, and I think in a way, like uh, much of this MMA stuff, I know a lot of gyms that, you know, let's say Taekwondo schools, for example, or, or certain style of karate schools shut down through all of this because, you know, they weren't teaching the grappling and everybody wanted, oh, I got to go to a school where there's grappling. So those schools, many of them are gone. As a matter of fact, many B BJJ schools are gone. You know, schools, gyms, it's, and this is all pre-COVID, so you can't pin it on COVID alone. But, you know, they were, they, the, the, they were diminishing before the COVID. And then in the COVID, in many instances, was just the final nail in the coffin. So I don't know. I'm not an economist. I'm certainly not world's greatest businessman. So I, I don't know what, um, you know, how to, you know, the future here. I don't know how to, you know, I don't know. I don't have the answers. I, th I think anytime you get something that becomes extremely popular and then really sought after and it becomes really widespread, you're going to get that watering down. And like you were saying with the Taekwondo schools and karate schools, I know a lot of them started marketing as like MMA gyms, you know, while we teach karate, we also have a guy that teaches, you know, grappling or something. So we're at MMA gym and MMA is such a broad term that pretty much any martial arts school, if they got multiple arts that they teach, they could claim that it's mixed martial arts. And now they're an MMA gym and now everybody's training there. And, you know, like you said, it perpetuates. Now you got instructors coming from there and new schools opening. So watering down can happen pretty easily if something's really widespread. Well, let me throw something in there because, uh, you know, I've had I get offers or whatever through the years, you know, uh, certain schools wanted me to come in and, you know, like teach their catch wrestling, but uh, financially it wasn't viable because they only may want you for like an hour, um, twice a week or three weeks or, you know, three, three times a week, whatever it is at off at off times. And, you know, what's the, you know, where's the money in that? There isn't, you know, if they're going to offer you something ridiculous, like, you know, a hundred dollars a week, which, which some were offering, I'm like, yeah, I wouldn't even come out there for a hundred dollars a day. It would have to be more. Um, so it, yeah. So, and I know this happens. So I know that there's instructors who let's say grappling instructors would maybe be very good, but that that's not going to give them financial independence. And you cannot immerse yourself in that. You know, it would take years for somebody to learn if, if they're only allowed three times a week, let's say. Uh, so yeah, it, that, it, so that's, that all works against everything. Uh, and it doesn't necessarily even have to be grappling. It could be substitute, you know, the grappling with anything else, you know, could be judo, could be amateur wrestling, it could be a weapons guy, you know, Again, I, I, I've seen schedules at some schools, <clears throat> how they they calendarize it and, you know, between the hours of 8 and 11 or, you know, 8 and 10 or whatever, you have this class, that class, that class. And then um, you have these open mats. Now, that, that's been for a while a big thing. So it's pretty much unsupervised where so that you don't even need an instructor there. So it, it boils down to school owners doing whatever they have to do to keep the doors open. So they may offer four or five different things like you're mentioning, Nico, we're an MMA school or whatever, we're because we teach all these, you know, different things. Um, 
but there is inherently a problem with that because if you got one instructor teaching striking, one in teaching kicking, one teaching conditioning, one teaching <clears throat> wrestling, grappling, whatever, boy, that's choppy. It's not a blended style. So you're kind of left on your own to fill in the blanks. And, uh, you know, that's the one thing I've always been proud of because I teach it all as one uh, complete uh, thing. So I would not want to learn like that. I mean, I, invariably I did when I was a kid, I, I learned the boxing, but then the wrestling, but I was able and encouraged to continually blend it. And my style of catch that I learned was very aggressive anyway, with the rips and all the, the other stuff. So there was no holes there, but um, for many there is, there's just not that, you know, they don't really get a chance to, to blend it all together and you don't really become balanced, I guess, because, you know, you're going to gravitate. Let's, what I mean is you may become far better at striking than grappling or vice versa. And then there's an imbalance there. So uh, it, 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 but again, it's up to the, indiv the individual. What, what, what are, what are their tastes? Some people may love to do that. That's how come JKD got popular back in, in the day because you, you, you're, you're learning different things. And for some people that works, you know, I'm not that kind of guy. You know, I, I don't think you can get good at anything by just dabbling. You know, um, I want to really like study in depth, whatever it is, you know, that I'm, uh, that I'm doing. Yeah, I think you're right that like a lot of people, well, I don't know a lot of people, but I, I think there are people who are definitely interested in diversity and dabbling. I think that keeps it interesting for them. I think it is a hard sell to say, hey, you know what, kick this bag a thousand times and get back to me, you know, or whatever it is, you know, like, again, it goes back to the dedication and, and, and that that is probably not as appealing to people, you know, or, or work this, this wrestling shot, you know, you don't need to know, um, you know, practice 13 different takedowns, get good at a two or three, you know, but that means spending a lot of time just drilling those and being, uh, uh, that can get tedious. Um, and that you have to be mentally disciplined to do that. Uh, and that's definitely not for everybody. You know, it's, it's hard to get people to sign up for that, I can imagine. Um, uh, and what's the payoff? You know, in high school, let's say, well, again, again just using examples, you're a high school wrestler, you want to go downstate, you know, and at least say that you did that, or maybe get so good that you might get a college scholarship and then go on to NCAA or go on to the Olympics or something, right? Uh, same with boxing or some other stuff. But, it, it, you know, if people don't have that goal, even in MMA, you know, you might want to be in the UFC. You know, that's a worthwhile goal to train. But for those who don't aspire for that, you know, well, what's the payoff? What, what are they going to get? You know, I mean, maybe they'll have a chance to open their own school. But if, if they see your school, the school they're going to is struggling, well, then there's not even any impetus to do that. So yeah, it's it's a uh, yeah it's it's a it's a difficult uh, it's a difficult thing. You know, it's a niche. It's a niche market. You know, uh, it's certainly not uh, something that's going to be you know um, lucrative for you know for anybody who does it. You know, it's there's no guarantee that it's going to be lucrative for everyone. So. Uh, and I also don't want to get into this because I only have a working knowledge, but the, the pro, <clears throat> pro, proliferation of <clears throat> Korean uh, martial arts schools, Taekwondo, Hapkido schools, or whatever, there was an organization, from what I was told, it was an organized plan, um, you know, how to, you know, opening schools and cooperation and help here and there. And so there's, there's a lot, there's a lot to it that I, I'm not really privy to all of that information, but um, so, you know, so you, you basically have other businessmen helping set you up and, and things like that. Uh, whereas in martial arts, you know, that's sometimes it's not, that's not the case. Or, you know, our, our martial arts, you know, the different stuff. So I know obviously you, your philosophy, I guess, or ethos is that, you know, obviously you're focusing on the people who can, who are able to, or can train hardcore. That's what you want to focus on. Um, 
But do you think there's, you know, obviously there's a kind of to Nico's point earlier that, you know, that's a small segment, you know, you've got a range of people who physically can do that, you know, but you've got a lot of other people who can benefit, or I guess the question is, do you feel there are people who, if you can't go hardcore, you could still benefit from getting some training? So. Well, it depends on what the training, like, you know, I've trained guys who aren't going to be world beaters. They're, they're not going to go that far, but they might coach or spread the art, and, you know, but everything I'm teaching them, the techniques are legitimate. Okay. They're like, it's hardcore, you know, like deadly moves, right? I, I'm not watering that down. Um, so I can't, so there may be schools that do remove, you know, like very effective techniques or they save those techniques, right? for their advanced or special students or however they want to label it. Um, so I can't answer that, but I've talked to people and I've said it on here. There's people that, you know, like my Tri-C program or whatever, you may not become the world's greatest fighter because of your age, or maybe you have handicaps, you know, that limit you bad knee or something, whatever, but you can gain the knowledge at least and become a coach and pass that along, you know, I may be, so I may be, I'm strict on the physicality for some people. I want them to, you know, give it their all if, you, if they're capable. But for those who aren't, there's, I will never compromise on knowledge. You know, you, you've, you've got to be 100% into gaining knowledge mentally, you know, even if you can't do it physically. If you can't give me that, then you, I'm not the guy for you. Don't train with me. Okay. I demand attention and to detail and just open your mind different way of thinking and so on if you can't give me that don't come to me but i know for a fact there's some instructors and i know you know that too both of you that don't they don't give a damn okay they're just going to show you whatever they feel like showing you they're not going to give you the bit of bigger picture for whatever their their reasons are there are some out there we've all encountered them so that's a good i think a point of clarification there's there's different areas where you can be hardcore. And so, um, you know, I, I didn't really think about it until we were just talking here, but like, obviously the first thing that I think people default to is just hardcore training that you're just going hard. Like you're going hundred percent all the time. And, you know, uh, so it's very physical, which tends to obviously point to young athletes, guys who are, you know, can, can take that and recover, but there's, you know, you mentioned that there's also just the hardcore other aspects of it, hardcore techniques. So you're not censoring techniques. You're not, you know, censoring, like you said, focus and mental discipline. So maybe your body can't keep up with the, you know, because a lot, most of us can't, most of us are not the young athletes, you know, I mean, like I started in my forties, right? I'm never going to have the output that I could have won in my twenties. You know, it doesn't mean I can't push myself and try and be stronger and harder, but I don't think I could handle, you know, as hard as you could push young guys, I would never be able to keep up with that. I don't think, but it doesn't mean that I can't work on learning the hardcore techniques. There's no reason to censor that because I will, regardless, you know, of how I can compete against others, I can still be a better fighter and be safer on the streets by learning these things. If that's my end game, because a lot of times you said, what's the end game or the goal? Am I trying, like for wrestlers, am I trying to get a college scholarship or am I trying to, you know, be ranked? Uh, but I think for the vast majority of people who are signing up, I would think, you know, it's, it's, it's physical safety, being, being safer than you were the day before you went in, you know, no, to be able to almost use it like a, like to me, like knowing CPR or knowing how to use a fire extinguisher. I mean, something that if things go sideways, you have, have this ability that you're going to be better off than had you not gone to the class. Well, I think that's where the watered down stuff that you're like technique wise comes from a martial art or whatever that just become so sport oriented and geared strictly to sport. And they weren't, they're not, they're not going to waste their time on techniques that don't work, you know, weren't, aren't allowed in any sort of competition, you know, um, multiple assailant training weapons, you know, defending against weapons strikes, perhaps if, if you're just interested in a grappling sport. So in that regard, yeah, things can get watered down. Even amateur wrestling has been watered down because it's advanced in one at, you know, in some areas, but dangerous holds, potentially dangerous holds, you know, anything that could hurt a guy uh, or gal has been, you know, eliminated for safety's purposes. So in that regard, a wrestling can be considered watered down. Although 
again, as I mentioned, other techniques have been introduced uh, that guys 40, 50, 60 years ago probably never saw, never even thought of, you know. Um, so, but yeah, for me, it's just, I'm never going to not, I'm never going to water. Okay, so for example, I'll show you the right way to do a top wrist lock. I would never train somebody to do it the bullshit way. Why would I do that? That would be an example of watering it down or never showing rips again. Because you can't use rips in any tournament in the world, so I'm never going to show that. That's a that would be watering it down, and I'm not going to do that. You know why would I? Because then no, why would you know? This reminds me of a conversation one of the very earliest YouTube videos you and I did. I think it was after a workout. We just, but it kind of goes to your point is that, I mean, like amateur wrestlers, they're training hardcore. I mean, they're, you know, they're tips, they're probably the, you know, in the best shape of any athletes out there. So in some ways, but yeah, but, but they're very censored as far as their techniques. So a lot of that, I mean, it's, it's kind of this, and, and there's, there's another tension, I guess, in training to talk about. It's kind of the, you need to kind of have sparring and uh, competition athleticism in your training. But at the same time, you need to not lose sight of skills and techniques that a lot of times you can't bring into a competitive, even if it's in, in like, not I'm talking a tournament or something with rules, but, you know, training with a partner, you know, uh, eye gouging, groin, groin strikes, you know, and, and, and kind of, it, it, that's a very difficult balance to get as well to say, okay, because there's, you know, there's, there's definitely people out there who train what I would consider kind of going for all those vital points or whatever, but that's all they do. They don't, they don't you know, get into the, you know, they don't strap on the gloves and box a couple rounds or they get on the mat and roll. Um, and so they're missing the, the physicality aspect of it. You know, there's weird, it's, it's, it's kind of, again, it goes back to that uh, balance. You have to make sure you, you're able to do both things that maybe are in conflict at times. Yeah, well, that's the thing. That's how I learned. For me, it was always that way. So that's been ingrained in me to do everything, all the Rips, I got strikes, everything, fighting, wrestling, kicking, punching. That's always been a part of it. So in that regard, I was l blessed, lucky, whatever, you know, however you want to name it. But, um, but there's no reason that others can't do that. I mean, it's, it's just that their style didn't teach all that. So now the student has to go to four different people you know, to learn all of this. And that's a problem because it's money. Now I got to pay four people as opposed to paying one. It's a time thing. It's a distance thing. And it's an availability thing. These things may just aren't available to, to most people because that's the biggest complaint I get uh, through the, it's just like, there's nobody that teaches your stuff, Tony. Uh, we want what you do, but I live in, you know, you know, middle of nowhere. It, I would love to go to a gym you know, four nights a week out here where I live. Well, they they don't exist. So they either abandon it completely or they end up studying something that that they they can't fully love as much because they know there's there's holes. So that's where you know they'll buy my videos or they'll uh, you know come for a few days of training to try to fill in the fill in the blanks. And now that makes my job immeasurable immeasurably more difficult yeah i just was working with a guy you know and nice great guy you know and he was shown or taught things in a certain way and i, I had to show him no no this is not how you do it so that you almost have to unlearn the what the guy's doing and uh and then even if you do teach him you only have a few days or maybe a matter of even a few hours are they going to retain it if they never see you again you know, then they go back home and they're not doing it right because they didn't have enough time to get the techniques down on a continual basis because nobody can go in the gym one day and master the moves. And so you got that issue. And then you have the other issue of the gym that they're going to back home. Will the instructor allow you to do this stuff? I, 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 most of the time, no. And that the instructor's right in that regard. It's his gym. You know, he, he can control what's going on. But the biggest thing is that they leave not knowing the technique yet, okay? Not putting in the, you know, thousands of hours to master the stuff, so they're going to get flushed out. It's just like I used to tell people about Dan Gable, right? 
If you watch a Dan Gable video on takedowns and that's all you do and you practice for 45 minutes and you go walk into even a high school gym, you know, you don't have a wrestling background. You're going to try this stuff. It's not going to work. You're going to get stuffed constantly. So who are you going to blame? Dan Gable? You're going to actually have the gall to say Gable shit don't work? You know, no. They forget that it's, it's, not, it's not even the move. It's the thousands of repetitions and the thousands of hours that you put in to make your body do it impeccably. And your mind sees all the different quick, subtle changes that you might have to make. There's so much to it. But people look for, you know, they got the hate in them, you know. So they're looking for a way to smear it. Oh, that, that doesn't work. See, I was able to stuff it. Well, yeah, because the guy doesn't know it yet, you know yeah it's it's amazing to me that people still fall for this ruse but you know you you have to put in the time and effort and that's the hardcore and in that you know there's another point on how a system can get watered down because maybe the student just didn't put in enough effort but still got belt ranked you know advanced and all of a sudden he's a black belt now he's going to open up his own school and because he really never put in all the effort against high level guys. When he starts to teach his stuff, it's not as effective as it can be. So it's unintentionally watering it down in that scenario. But, um, you know, it's still, you know, it's still a, a situation that can crop up. So, you know, you, you just have to put in the time and effort. And a lot of people get frustrated even with me because they just want to keep on moving on. They want to learn more techniques, more techniques, more techniques. Well, you're, you're not. You're going to end up you know, being a demonstrator. You're not going to be able to pull it off if you just don't put in the practice. You know that. You guys both know that. So th and that kind of brings up uh, something I wanted to talk to you about, Tony, because for let's just say, for example, from, from my perspective, like training with you, okay, I can't get to, to you very often at all especially now it's like yeah. almost never and training with you online you know that seems to be a good option but like you said like where am i going to go practice the moves i mean a lot of these places i can't i have to practice whatever the instructor is showing and, and a lot of times that you know a lot of those things i'm not able to do and then i need people to work with and i need a place to do it i mean that's that's what's kind of holding me back to continuing on in the program is just accessibility. Like I can't, I can't get to you. I, you know, if I go to a gym, I got to practice what they teach. You know, I don't, I don't really like, maybe I know Joe, maybe a couple guys that are interested, but that's about it. You know, but if I go to another gym, you know, maybe it's not teaching the catch wrestling that I'd like to learn, but I got 30 guys I could practice with, you know what I mean? Yeah. Well, so what, what, I mean, what are some of the things you think you can kind of, <laughs> get through that and let me tell you what happened with me and it first and foremost is this um i used to go to like when i would do the wrestling at the boxing gym i would get a couple of guys and just you know hey we're doing the boxing thing but hey can you give me 30 minutes so i can work on my shit okay uh and and, and that's something you could ask any school owner you know uh you, let's say you're going to joe blows karate school hey uh, sensei can I come in 30 minutes early? Can I stay 30 minutes late on my own time? You know, just to work on a couple of things that I'm doing on the side. You know, uh, I've seen this done many, many times. And, yeah. and that's, that's the best approach is just being honest with the instructor and using some diplomacy. You know, don't uh, offend the guy by saying, you know, your shit's not you know, good enough. I want to no, just explain it. This is something that I desire to learn. And you can go into the details why. And say, you know, it would be awesome for me if you could allow me to do this, you know, and then say you're in the instructor, the Tri-C instructor program. Just say, hey, you know, you can email Tony or maybe even bring Tony in uh, just to talk. You know, if you, it, you, know, you can't bring me in if I live like, you know, you're a thousand miles away. But I could do a Zoom meeting like this with the instructor and just say, hey, you know, this is, uh, you know, and, and, and then I can, I can help that guy out. Maybe that instructor would be interested then in wanting to get affiliated or something. Um, your only other option then is to not do it at all. So, yeah. you know, I can't preach. 
I'm not going to be one of these over the top salesmen that says, you know, you, you have to do my shit. Um, but these are some of the reasons why I will more than likely not be teaching longer because, you know, I can't fight the world and especially after COVID. So I have to do what I have to do to put food on my table, you know, and, you know, if, if, if people, and I'm not, I'm going to use you as an example that you just brought up. If, if you find more reasons to not train with me, than you do to train with me. Well, then that's it. It's over for me. And it's definitely over for you. And it's over for anybody who wants to learn this style of catch wrestling. So um, it, it's, it takes legwork on your part. Uh, not you specifically, I'm just using you in the, in the example to, you know, hey, talk to the, the guy, the, you know, the karate instructor or, you know, advertise locally, uh, you know, on Craigslist or whatever you guys do, Facebook or something, just say, hey, I'm looking for a few guys, you know, to work out with. Uh, and let's, you know, let's get a little club going or something, but not just on your own. I don't approve of all of that. You know, you, yeah. you have to have a structured like me instructing you. Otherwise you're going to have a bunch of guys that don't know what they're doing. And you talk about watered down. That's the surefire way of watering everything down. So uh, those are the only things that I can, I can say. And I've told people like, there's this great father and son that trained tri, tri C thing out of uh, Canada with me. And he, the dad was pretty upfront in the beginning. We'll probably never come to Chicago. Okay. Probably never going to happen, but they're working out, you know, in their basement together and they send me the videos and it's wonderful. Right. And I get to see their progress and so on. So, uh, and it doesn't take a ton of mat space, especially in the beginning. So I'm, I'm rambling, but even if, if somebody's really interested in starting the tri C program, do it because it's going to be a long time of training. <clears throat> and then down the line, you don't have to have everything in place right now. You don't have to have five training partners right now or whatever, you know, you start with one, start by yourself, then get that training partner. And then it's going to start picking up and word of mouth. And then all of a sudden you're in. So that's, that's getting back to, like I said earlier, about when guys would come to, to the gym before and they weren't in shape, they couldn't handle the training program. So some of them would quit or they'd say, well, I'll go somewhere else and get in shape. No, you won't. You'll never get in shape unless you stay, you're here already, train here. Uh, and, and it's just like bench pressing. I could show you how to bench press. You're not going to leave here winning a bench press competition because I showed you the technique of bench pressing. It's going to take you years to build up your strength so that's how you have to approach all training including the tri c or distance training is you you're not going to have the complete picture today but if you start today you know in six months in a year you know you'll, you may have more training partners than you even want you know just you know yeah that's that's some good suggestions tony and um i think also like you were saying, most gyms have in their slots an open mat time on their schedule. And I think that's another good time where you could practice the, the catch wrestling. So like, like for me, where I'm staying at during the week, there's a, there's a really cool MMA gym that will not inhibit pretty much any of the moves that you show me. And I could, I could go to the open mat times and, and practice it. The problem for me right now is just, I don't have the time to get there. I'm doing like 70 yeah. hours of work, but that's usually how it works. You know, when I, when I have the availability, I don't have the time. Um, but uh, yeah, the open mat time is another, I think another good time. And I, and I bet you if I went into that gym and I, and I talked to like a bunch of the people say, Hey, I bet you a bunch of the people, at least over half already know Tony Cicchini and they're interested, you know, they're interested in the techniques and stuff. It's just getting, getting, putting yourself out there and, and, um, you know, working it in, in the time slots that are available. So, but. No, that, yeah. and that's on, that would be on you or whoever the other person is. And then, yeah. you know, and then you, you work with a couple guys and say, Hey man, let's all chip in so we can pay Tony's three grand for the tri C. And, and then here you're not paying 3000 on your own. You know, it's not even that it's whatever, you know, and, yeah. uh, you know, you, you get, so anyway, there's, there's always, there's always a solution. You just, and when I say you again, I don't mean you specifically, but when you, there's, there's solutions out there 
everybody's situation may be unique, um, but it may be just a case of even buying four or five foldable mats, you know, for the beginning, you know, just so you have something to lay on. You don't need the mats really to do any of the stand up stuff. Uh, you know, there, you just got to be creative. And, and the, the financial outlay normally isn't that much. It's, but I get it about finding the training partners, but that's every school owner goes through that too. You know, every school owner would probably wish they had a thousand students, right? So they could not only be rolling in the dough, but spreading their art that they love and put their life to, <clears throat> to a broader audience. But unfortunately, that's not always the case. Uh, so they, they function with what, with what they have. But, but for me, I mean, I did not have an ideal training situation. I, I wasn't able to walk into a school with, with 30 freaking guys, you know, so it didn't stop me. Uh, same with my music. I never took, when I was studying jazz theory, jazz accordion, I didn't go to a music school. Uh, there was no jazz accordion school. I studied out of one, the first, the classical guy, it was out of his house. And then uh, Ronnie Moon came to my house. And then when I moved to Chicago, Jerry, I'd either go to his house or sometimes he'd come to my apartment. So yeah, I never had a classroom, okay, is what I'm getting at from my musical studies. I never once was in a classroom. It was always on my own and I'd have to go home and practice. So there's options out there, man. It, it's just the, the hardest part, I think, is the commitment. It's to say, all right, I'm going to just do it. Here, here's here. I'm going to hit the, I'm going to place the order. Here's the button. And I, I'm telling you, everything will come in time. It's not like I tell you, okay, now you have six months to finish this course and that's it. Okay. No, I don't say that. It's just get your shit in order. Sometimes you may have to take a pause. Okay. Take a pause. But, you know, uh, it is what it is. So if somebody's out there that's really interested in, in learning, that's their only option. That's that's the best way of doing it. And it's like a it's like a it's a private lesson. <laughs> you know, it's better than even a, a class where the where the instructor can't stop. You know, you can't take if you got 20 people paired up grappling in an hour, hour and a half class, that teacher cannot stop and spend 20 minutes on each person. You know, it's just basically a group. This is, in essence, better than a group. It's it's private. You know? But anyway, uh, let's move on because we don't have all that much time left. Joe, did you have anything else to bring to the table? No, I think those were the only things that I was kind of uh, something I want to bring up, you know, to kind of get your thoughts on and kind of stir some conversation. That's yeah. Well... I want to touch on something then, kind of like a, uh, you know, well, you know what? No, because it would deserve more time than what we have left to dedicate it to. But on a future podcast, uh, I want to discuss something um, of a personal nature uh, and it may help people out there. There's 6 million people in America that are dealing with an issue that I think is overlooked misunderstood completely and i don't know if anybody that follows our podcast is in the same position that i am in dealing with someone who has alzheimer's but i think this is a topic that needs to be discussed uh one day on this podcast uh because it it is a very misunderstood uh issue health issue disease and um i don't think it's getting the attention that it it needs but we'll say that for, for another time. But uh, yeah, so that's pretty much it. I'm going to have a chill day today. I am not going to cut the grass until tomorrow. I'm going to make tomorrow my my work day around this house and you know, get stuff done. Cool. Um, yeah, I don't know. I don't have any really big plans for Father's Day. I don't even know if you'll be able to get to see all the kids there. You know, well, I definitely won't see Casey, but um, get to message him and... Uh, Otherwise, try and relax. But it, otherwise, it's just a, an average Sunday for me. What about you, Nico? You got any uh, big plans? Or are you just enjoying your day off of work? Um, I, I don't really 
do holidays so much. So <laughs> just another day for me. Yeah, every day is another day for me. It's, you know, I can't even do holidays, uh, even if I wanted to, because my mom is not, um, you know, last week was my birthday. Uh, matter of fact, a week ago today, and she didn't know. And, you know, I wasn't going to say anything. And then somebody said it. Somebody came by and, you know, uh, my friend Scott, and um, she still was oblivious because he doesn't put two and two together. Um, so it, 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 it makes things quite difficult. So yeah, I didn't celebrate Christmas or no, anything, you know, it's, that's, that's something of the past, right? It's not going to be anything, uh, you know, it's tough, you know, it's hard, but it's, it's, it's really hard on the caregiver for the Alzheimer's patient um, or, or so, anyone who's suffering from uh, a dementia. Um, prepare yourselves, man, for it. It doesn't get good. It doesn't get better. <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, that's a good point that, yeah, I mean, any, any serious illness like that, it obviously not only affects the, the person suffering it, but, you know, those who are there, you know, part of their family and they're going to take around it, you know, and that's, that's part of the tragedy of it, you know, is it, uh, you know, there's, waves of uh impact that that has on all the people around them that's you know and you're right i think i think it'd be good to have a podcast to talk about that well yeah because i've become you know i've i've been dealing with this for many years okay minimum of eight years but actually longer uh when you when i start to look back but um yeah and uh that you got to have your own support group, which I don't have. That's, as you know, I've always complained about that. I don't have that support group. That's what's finishing me off. That's what's taking its toll. So we'll get into that, you know, because to the people who, you know, having a good support group is like having a good training partner or, or a good training group of guys, right? Um, or having the, that instructor that you could go to to ask questions. You know, when you don't have that in anything you're facing, any health crisis, no matter what it is, if you don't have a sufficient support group, uh, it makes your journey that much more difficult. And, you know, but again, let's save the rest of that for, for another time. But, um, yeah, so that's it, man. Uh, we I think we covered a pretty good topic that you brought up, Joe, and I, that's just my little insight, but. Thank you. Yeah, I think I'm glad we talked that through. Um, well, yeah, for everybody who's out there listening, who's a dad, have a great Father's Day. And yeah, happy Father's uh, Day. Yeah, everybody enjoy their weekend otherwise. All right, and I'll talk to you guys soon. All right, everybody, have a good week. Bye. Have a good week. On.